Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show. Discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Hosted by Desiree Duffy. Welcome, everybody. It's time for the Books That Make You Show. And I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. And we are talking about books that make you look at evolution of civilization through the lens of rising cognition. Wow, we have quite the topic today. Humanity continues to evolve. It hasn't stopped. It is on an accelerating path of rising cognition, is it? According to our guest today, the Darwinian process of evolution has given way to a fast and directed cognitive evolution. It's dividing our politics, our economies, our technology, it's affecting sciences, it's affecting the arts, it's affecting the very way that we live. Barg Yora Goldberg is with us today. He's our guest discussing how the world seems to be more and more like an idea. It's not just what we make of it, but what we think of it. Our universe is now mostly virtual. Think about it. It's, it's make-believe. After a long history, we now find ourselves at the dawn of a new epoch that requires less material things, less physicality, one that's manifested by our cognition, the age of idea. Barr is an American-Israeli scholar, author, and entrepreneur. His book is called The Mind is Mightier. And in this book, our intellectual history is presented as the evolution of our cognitive processes that are also growing in complexity. Again, science, the arts, technology, law, language, politics, economy, they're all becoming so much more complex. Though complexity is just rife with different challenges, we are ultimately better for it. Bar, hello. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. This is very kind of you. This is quite a topic. There is so much to unravel here. Your book, it's part science, part critical philosophies, essays. There's psychology in it. There's just a lot going on. Can you, in your own words, tell us about your book? Yes, yeah, so I would like to, intu- to introduce the book, first of all, as the recognition that we are in the beginning, or maybe even in the middle, of a huge revolution. And many serious thinkers think that maybe we are at the beginning of the greatest revolution. And the reason for it is that previous revolutions were mostly quantitative. Now we are talking about qualitative changes because the rise of very complex computers, uh, of course, uh, artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. coupled with biochemistry and biotech and the cognitive sciences are suddenly presenting us with possibility that we never thought about. It's not only now playing with genes and changing eye color. We are talking about probably creating machines that already make better decisions than us, and eventually will be able to make us smarter. So now it's a totally complex game. And I think that the center, as Desiree said, uh, is this huge rise of complexity that we probably cannot even control anymore. What I mean by this is our, our brain has evolved into a certain structure. We cannot analyze the statistics of 100 million people or their traits or, you know, elections and think we need computers for this. And in fact, the computers are already running our lives. So today, the complexity level is such that most of us really don't understand what is going on to the detail. How many of us understand quantum mechanics? And that's not even a new thing. 100 years. How many of us understand cosmology, general relativity, which is really these two areas are at the center of physics today. I mean, the big things that are happening in cosmology, if you take a seminar in cosmology today, you're going to study the last 20 years, not the last 5,000 years, because everything is happening now. So this huge complexity is now uh, presenting itself to us 
and, and we need to be able to control it because after all, with all due respect, we are still masters of the machine. So the machine can do wonderful things for us, but I'm on the idea that at this point in time, we are the masters, we program the machines. When we invent algorithms, we actually tell the machine, what is the cost function? What are you algorithming for? So that is something we do. But on the other hand, uh, the complexity of the issues is such that we need to use outside machine. I mean, big data is not something we can do with our brain ever. It, it never evolved to do that. So all of this is moving us to a new place where, first of all, complexity is the central issue. And in fact, my book is really uh, a history, not of chronicles, but of ideas, as Desiree mentioned, and how ideas in law, in politics, in art, in music, in painting, in architecture, has started from the, what we consider today very simple into the very complex, I mean, modern art. I mean, many of us really don't buy it at all. And in fact, there is room for charlatans in modern art too, but the great modern art is, is much more complex than ever before. And you know, and I think that the other point that I wanted to make in the book is the importance of education, because when things become so complicated, we, we, I mean, not the, the top half a percent, but all of us together have to be better educated, better understanding what is going on. And education today is not studying a profession because professions are disappearing from the face of the earth and new ones are emerging. The school is supposed to do what it was initially meant to be, and that is teaching us how to learn. So by the time we're 20 years old and we finish university or 21 years old, then we know how to learn because most of the young people who are entering the field today are going to go through three, four careers. And it's not be possible to learn them today. They will have to continue to understand what is going in their field and in other field, because life is going to become so complex. Yes. Yeah. So much there to talk about. Okay. I've got a couple of things I'm going to circle back to. But first of all, I just want to zero in on when you talk about art. Just watch the documentary about the um, Jackson Pollock and some of the great, great masters of modern art that were actually forged. And when you think about art, the art world, people creating forgeries and how people identify art, there's some kind of certification, there, there's a paper trail. But what's happening now in the world of art and in other things on the internet is what's called NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So there's all sorts of things going on where we can actually verify a thing. It's not like the olden days where you have a piece of paper, maybe somebody forges the piece of paper and then says, this is a real work of art. Well, how can you prove that? Hello, NFTs can do that. And cryptocurrency is held on this thing called a blockchain. And there's no way that you can allegedly fudge that. So if you want to, if you don't mind just humoring me a little bit, at, you know, after I got went off on my NFT and cryptocurrency tangent, can you maybe talk to that a little bit? Because I think that's something that's exciting, fascinating, and a little bit scary too. Well, you know, obviously we can do today things that we could never do before. Because if you look at the history of art, for example, or say painting, right? We start to paint very early. We have cave paintings that are 50, 60,000 years old and they're pretty good. But the purpose of painting until a few hundred years ago, not that much, was really to represent reality the best way we can. So, we invented perspective at about the 15th century, the beginning of the 15th century. And now we could, on, on a two-dimensional piece of paper, present a three-dimensional world. And, and we got, became better and better at it. But already the 17th century, the, the, the purpose of art was not exactly to represent reality as it is, but became more cognitive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and of course, if you if you not only look at a painting, but say move to music, I mean, to me, Beethoven is really the seminal cognitive uh, composer, which obviously I admire the most because 
the fifth symphony, which you know we all adore. What is it? It's like these four tones, which he somehow manages to modulate, and but it's the whole first movement of the symphony, which is like ten minutes. It's about these four tones, and then when you think that you are done with it, the second movement, the third, and the fourth, it's just hidden. It's there continues to be there and continue to play with it. It becomes really, I mean, his idea about great music was not this, you know, long, beautiful melodies, but almost like pointillism, taking something very, very simple. What can I do with nothing? And some of, some of the other pieces that are well, maybe less known, I don't want to mention them here, are even less than this. Like a single tone is repeating itself a few times, and that becomes the motto of a 10-minute movement. So, so everything is becoming, you know, much more cognitive, and of course there is room for forgeries, and in fact some of them are wonderful. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen the program about the the recent um, Leonardo Princesa, mm-hmm. which is that they somebody found in an auction and bought it for like twenty thousand dollars, and then decided that to maybe this is more than that. And the work that was done about is, my God, I'm not going to tell it now, it's like a 50-minute program, but the work is done tracing it in history and, you know, the vellum that is used and, you know, the thinking, Mm -hmm. the the way that he's using the left hand, which is important. And, and, and of course, now it has a, a value of maybe of 80 million. He's still not selling because suddenly he has maybe an authentic Leonardo, which very few of us have. So, um, so the, the the tools, right? I mean, the cameras, the, the the resolution that they have to use all the things is just amazing, and it's going to get only better because now you know we start to develop tools that are looking at our genetics and our very basic forms of life, and we play with it, and we obviously are going to play with it, and it's not far fetched to assume that within 20, 30, 40 years, we will be able to produce a smarter baby. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because our intelligence is not in a single gene, obviously, but maybe in a few hundred of them. Well, we have enough computing power maybe then to do that. Oh, yeah. And okay, I do want to talk about education because you brought that up, and that's a cornerstone of what we're talking about. But I just also want to zero in on this idea of things being so simplistic. When you break something down, you bring it down to its its very fundamental level. And in that simplicity, you can build back up into complexity. And even the fact that you have, this is from your book cover, and you can go ahead and hold up your real book cover if you'd like, because you have an enamide on it which is essentially this repeating thing. It reminds me of a fractal. And one of the things that's really cool about fractals in math as well as in art is it's the same design and it keeps repeating and you can pull out and it's like this wall of mirrors. So it seems to me that a lot of what you're talking about has this very simplistic quality, but yet there's a lot of complexities. And it's because of these complexities that the human mind in needing to understand it, and this leads into the educational aspect, that we ourselves need to become more educated, smarter, and we are being taught how to think, not necessarily a trade or just something that makes us so that we can, you know, have a certain career. It's more of a fundamental um, learning process that helps us understand the entirety of our world. Is that... Yeah, and I think that today, for example, you know, if you look at what Stanford is doing is AI, they recognize the fact that in order not to create a monster, we need to be multidisciplinary. So it's not only equations and math, but you have to involve other members in philosophy, in cognitive sciences, in ethics to be involved in that. And so absolutely, I think, you know, we cannot become so narrow as, as we are happening now, right? I mean, engineers, when, you know, when I went to school, was already probably engineers are so focused and there's so much material that uh, that sometimes you you will start to work on a project that makes no sense at all. So we need to broaden. But I'd like to say a word 
about what you said before, because to me, complexity is very difficult to define. If you look at the encyclopedia or the, or the dictionary, you will see that there are a few uh, very complex definitions that, that are tough to, it's still, it's, it's like beauty. It's something that we think that we know, but we're not sure how to define it. But to me, uh, the, the essence of it has two basic components. There are certain concepts that are very difficult by themselves. I mean, there is a reason why we study uh, quantum mechanics, not, not in primary school, or, you know, Einstein general relativity equations only in you know, university or even in graduate school, because they are very difficult. They're very alien to our thinking. I mean, quantum mechanics, we understand totally that we probably will never know what an electron is, right? I mean, we know about him now for more than 100 years. What is it? Oh, but he knows, right? We measure the mass, we measure the electricity, we know so much about it. But what is it? It's not that small ball. Uh, absolutely not. It's something else. And we'll never be, we know a long time that we'll never be able to see it. You cannot see it. It's just mm-hmm. the mass is too small to see. But there is another type of complexity that emerges from what you mentioned. That is very simple elements, but in huge quantity. Um, Computers, right? I mean, we cannot design computer chips now that have 500 million, a billion chips on them. Obviously, we could never do it because our mind couldn't. And we have to use computers for it, obviously. But if you look at the basic element of very simple functions, right? Logic functions, memory. But when this comes together with huge quantity, it becomes so complex, you know, and maybe our brain, who, you know, nobody knows really anything about our brain. I mean, with all the work that has been going on and, you know, all the respect that I have to these people, we have no clue. I mean, the big issue of science and, and, and psychology today is what is consciousness? And nobody knows, right? So every amoeba has a consciousness, right? I mean... Every living matter, I believe, has consciousness, obviously on certain level, different level, right? We have very high level of consciousness. We are conscious about being conscious. Maybe the amoeba is not. But maybe our brain is really kind of a neural network that is made of this, you know, hundreds of billions of interconnections that together can do very complex processes just because of the quantity. And so, and exa- that's exactly what's happening with computers. You know, the, the the power of the computer is that there, there, there are billions of transistors that can do certain things. But the basic element is kind of what you said uh, in the beginning of this section that can be very very simple. But this simplicity, this fractal simplicity, creates the shore of San Diego. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, in, in, in a way you can't see it, but on the inside, my mind is just going like it's having that explosion. It's like whoosh, mind blown because you, me, we're both conscious right now. We are both talking about the universe and the nature of the universe. In a way, right now, we are the universe discussing itself, being aware of itself because we are conscious. So we can't say that the universe has no consciousness when we are part of the universe, we are conscious and we are in it. And to your point, what does consciousness mean? Can AI have consciousness? I don't think we know. We might create an AI that creates another AI that creates another AI, and they keep building up. For all we know, it could be just a few more years until our computer overlords just kind of take over. And to that, I want to say, because you don't seem very afraid of AI, and there's a lot of people who are afraid of AI. Why are you not afraid that this could be the detriment and the undoing of human civilization? Well, actually, I am afraid, but but I'll try to explain, you know, the way I look at it. I look at it, first of all, you know, we always, we are always scared of the edge of technology because this is kind of the unknown. And so, so I look at it as a fantastic tool. It's like the best tool we the best cognitive tool that we invented. And and incidentally, we're in the middle of it. Even today, you know, computers are running everything. I mean, 
you walk into a store even, I'm not talking about the complicated, you know, physics laboratory. If the computer doesn't work, everything stops. You, you can't buy anything because all the inventory and everything is managed by computers, and that is fine. So we are already in certain ways depending very much on it. But as long as AI is not controlled by evil people, by, by you know, strongman dictators who think all day how to subjugate us to, our, to their power, as long as we have democracy, which really, what is democracy? It's a distributed system. It's not all in the center, right? I mean, the chairman of the party of China is not controlling everything. In America, um, we have really, democracy is a distributed system and, and we should preserve this distributed system. The problem is that this power, this immense power that I agree with you, AI has become now a mythology, right? And all these people tell you what could happen and what could happen. Let the mythology a little bit subside and see what happens, right? We still have time in front of us. We are a young species after all. But, um, but uh, obviously it's a huge potential that in the wrong hands can do cre- tremendous uh, damage. So there is a very good reason to worry about it. On the other hand, I see the tremendous uh, promise. I mean, you, you know, we are going to work less we are going to be much wealthier. UBI is probably going to happen because it must happen, not because we are good and we want to uh, to distribute our earth to everybody, but because it has to be done. If if 20 million drivers lose their job, even gradually, if if 10 million bar barmen and women women lose their job. Not everybody will be, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, go train yourself to a new, a new job. You know, when you're 55, 60 years old, you can't do it anymore. And I'm not sure how well you can do it when you're 30 even. So, so we are facing, you know, a, a probably the most interesting era of all history. I think so. It's probably more interesting the Reformation, definitely more interesting the, than the Industrial Revolution. We are in, in a much more serious revolution that requires brains and cognition. And, and, and so it's important. I mean, the book was written in order to increase the awareness of what's happening in terms of cognition and complexity, which continue to raise no matter uh, what we want to do, right? I talk with friends and say, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to adapt? We're all men by now, all women. It's very difficult, but it's not going to stop for us, not going to stop for anybody. This is going. And so we need to somehow find a way to have more of us participate. It's not a good thing that 1% uh, will manage the whole thing because who knows where different ideas, especially if we can uh, improve our brains, where this can lead. I mean, we don't want two species here. You know, we are Democrats. We want to share the knowledge and the wealth and the good life with as many people who want to participate, well, they need, everybody needs to make the effort. You yeah. And, yeah. and everybody else. Yeah, okay, the, that I think is the key point. It's, we have to stay engaged. We have to advocate for a democratic society. And I'm not talking Democrats versus Republicans. Like, I don't right. want people to feel like, oh, the, 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 here goes the liberals off on their tangent again. But if you really think about it, think of how every sci-fi writer, how every utopian type writer imagines the future. You know, even as cliche as it sounds, think of the old cartoon, The Jetson, where Mr. Jetson went to work and he just sat there and pressed a button. And we laugh at that now. But in a way, if we have a society where people have more leisure time, like you're saying, So what if the waitress can't wait tables to make money? What if she can write a book that's a beautiful memoir that gives to society in an artistic way? Or she paints or she works with children in a way that helps educate them. There's so many things that human beings can do. And when you alleviate them from some of the menial or manual tasks that occupy their time, I see that, that creativity as being something that uplifts us all. 
What do you have to say to, to that idea? Well, you know, the thing is that you're right. We are losing so many professions, but we are also gaining all the time new ones. I mean, think about America 2020, 2021, doesn't matter. We don't have enough workers. If you travel today, which I do a lot, uh, if you travel today, you see what's happening in hotels, in 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 restaurants. There's not enough workers. So somehow, people who want to work find a job because there are new jobs that are being created all the time. I mean, who imagined, you know, 10 years ago that the office not far away from here will employ 5,000 people in, in serving Instagram for businesses or for individuals? We could imagine. But... It's growing so, but the problem is that you have to have an education, and you need to what's going on all the time. You know, when the president, President Biden, said recently that infrastructure is wonderful because it will create few millions of jobs, and these people don't have to be educated, kind of worried me that uh, it's true, right? I mean, in certain ways, it's true. But still, even construction today is not what it used to be. It's a lot of automation. There's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of cognition in it. It's not anymore, you know, machines are doing most of the job, right? I mean, everything is electrical and, and automated. So he's right in certain ways that it will provide a job for a few, for, you know, for a few million people who, uh, first of all, we need that, and then uh, that maybe don't have a job. But this is not our plan. Our plan is to to become a service industry. I mean, we already are a service industry. We're not building that much. Everything is built in other places. And thank God, let them build it because their uh, manpower is much cheaper than ours and we can compete with this. And, and I think it's okay. Fact is that today with all the warning, employment is very, very high. Even after the, the COVID, we are talking about what? Uh, 5% unemployment, 4% unemployment. Numbers are very, very low historically, which means that we create new professions, but you need to be able to make the adaptation. And that requires, if you're not born, you know, Oscar Wilde or Albert Einstein, requires it, uh, people like us require engineer, uh, education. We need to know the tools. Yes, yes. <laughs> and one of the ways to learn those tools is by reading your book, The Mind is my dear. Um, go ahead and hold that up for us again, if you could. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. We're, we're running up against the clock. Is there anything else? Cause we we've touched a little bit. We education, politics, um, the economy, uh, anything else that we want to talk about before we run out of time? Well, you know, I think that even if you talk about the economy or currency, we are now facing a new currency, right? Uh, cryptocurrency is a new thing. Mm -hmm. It's totally abstract, even more abstract than the dollar. The dollar is already abstract. This is so paper, right? I mean, you take this piece of paper, $20 bill, you go to a store and you bring home a bunch of produce with you, which is by itself a huge, I mean, the invention of money was a huge cognitive revolution in the history of humanity and paper money, which is only, what, 300 years. Now we are moving into the next step. So all this is becoming more and more cognitive, more mental. And that's the focus that we have to do. Uh, not that sport are not important or that food making, you know, food making is very uh, sophisticated. Actually, today. I mean, you can be a fantastic chef and, and use all these technologies. But I mean, the message really, the rise of cognition and complexity in an accelerated, in an accelerated manner today that needs to be, we need to pay attention and to know who we are and what we can and cannot do. Yeah, exactly. I could probably have a, an entire show just talking with you about cryptocurrency and what's going on with that. Um, I would like to say thanks, Elon Musk, for uh, making my Dogecoin drop down. You know, there's so, there, you know, you kind of talk about, you know, the personality and, you know, how that all interacts. But at the same time, there is a lot to look forward to with cryptocurrencies. And well, it seems crypto is going to happen. But the problem is that the government, the government can't allow uh, Bitcoin to control this. So it's going, we're going to have government cryptocurrencies that they are going to be the currency. It will take some time. It's not going away. I mean, this is such an important cognitive uh, process. 
Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what I think, too. At some point, the government, they, the, the, the big banks that were putting them in jeopardy with cryptocurrencies. And at some Absolutely. point, they're going to be like, hey, nah, and we'll see what happens when when that comes to fruition. The banks will not like it because, you know, when you when you trade, uh, you, you transfer money from bank to bank, the bank are charging a, a fortune. With crypto, it's much, much very cheaper. So the bank are not going to, but it doesn't matter. The bank will make money, you know, get, uh, making us mortgages. The government is going to issue crypto, and that's going to control the world. And the dollar will continue to be probably very, very strong for who, lo- who knows how long. Yeah, exactly. Imagine a world where, I mean, even at this point in time, about... A year ago, I took $100 out of the bank because when the pandemic hit, I just wanted to have some cash in my wallet. Just cash, just in case. I wasn't sure. I still got $5 left from a a year ago when I took out $100. That's how seldom I use cash. It doesn't doesn't have any meaning anymore. It's just amazing. Yeah. Already credit credit cards declared war on cash for many years. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, Farg, Yor, Goldberg. Oh my gosh, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Can you tell everybody where they can go to find out more about your book, about you, follow you on social media? Give us your website, all your details. So uh, if you go to one word, themindismightier.com, there is kind of an introduction. And if you go to Instagram, Again, go to The Mind is Mightier. You can see we are just starting now to do some work on it. You can start to see the work and the interest. And, uh, and I have an email, uh, which is bargiorwriter uh, at gmail.com. And uh, I hope to see you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Bar. I enjoyed the conversation. Me. You bet. Pleasure. You bet. And thank you, everyone, for being here today on the Books That Make You show. You can find out more about us on our website. It's booksthatmakeyou.com. We're also on Facebook and we're on Instagram. We're going to go follow you there on Instagram bar. So you'll have a new Instagram friend there as well. We're on YouTube. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you're always up to date on all of our shows and our conversations with authors as well. Sign up for our newsletter. You can find out more about that again on booksthatmakeyou.com. Um, find out where you can win books and find out about new books and everything that's going on in the literary world. Until next time, all of my book buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The executive producer for Books That Make You is Desiree Duffy, produced and sound mastered by Phil Jean Grande, engineering by Dave Nabox, social media and promotion by Bree Sweeter. For more, visit booksthatmakeyou.com.